Well, good evening, everyone. Uh, my name's Simon. If we haven't met before, I'm the Minister for Evangelism here at All Souls. Oh, that question earlier about distractions, there was one thing that popped into my mind. My phone. Anyone else with me on that? First thing I think of, I'm trying to do something good, like I don't know, concentrate on doing some productive work or play with my children in front of me. And then before I know it, I've kind of got this dopamine twitch to get my phone out. And before I know it, I've spent an hour on YouTube watching all 56 of David Beckham's um, career free kick goals. And I've already watched that video 10 times. And I could have been doing something useful, um, engaging with my children or doing some work. I hate distraction. Distraction, don't you hate it? And the tragedy of distraction is it's the wasted opportunity. And it's one thing to have a moment of distraction on your phone. And it's another to have a distracted life. We could be doing something with our lives that's good, that's joyful, that's, that's wholesome, that's holy, that's godly. But distraction, in the moment, it feels like it's filling a hole. But after a while, it just makes us feel purposeless. Apparently, 89% of young Brits today say they feel like their lives lack purpose. Well, Haggai chapter 1 is an invitation from God to purpose by throwing distraction in the bin. It is an invitation from God to get a passion in life that's so strong that it, it totally reorders our priorities in life. Putting God's work, God's work for the sake of God's honour, right at the top of our list of priorities. Have a look at me, please, at Haggai chapter 1, verse 8, and page 948. In your Bible's page 948. Haggai chapter 1, verse 8. God says this. Go up into the mountains and bring down timber and build my house so that I may take pleasure in it. And be honoured, says the Lord. Here is a purpose for life. Taking part in building something beautiful and good here in our lifetimes. Which is worthy of the honour of God. We're going to find out is having the privilege of working on God's global building project. Not bricks, but people. Making disciples for his glory. So let's pray as we listen together to God's invitation to reorder our lives. Let's pray. Our Father, tonight we want to join with the people of Haggai's day in giving careful thought to our ways. Please, Lord, by your Spirit, stir us to see you more clearly. And please give us honesty with ourselves to carefully consider our ways that we might live for you and for your honour and build your kingdom. Amen. Now, reading a new book of the Bible, um, like we're here today, we need to know where we are in the story of God's people. Um, we had a really helpful Bible project video played earlier, um, but really two headlines I want to flag up for us to bear in mind. And the first is exile and return. So in the Old Testament times, God's people lived in Israel, but they had been unfaithful to him. They refused to obey him. So God sent them away via an invading army um, who laid siege to Jerusalem, and they destroyed the city. Um, they tore down the temple uh, where the people had worshipped God and they destroyed their houses and the people were then sent away um, to live as exiles in Babylon. But in his mercy, God didn't give up on his people forever. And the Persians defeat Babylon and the Persians then become the superpower of the day and they allow God's people to return back to Jerusalem. So the first point is they're exiled, they returned. And then second is rebuilding and pausing. So when they get back to Jerusalem, they have this massive to-do list, um, a huge one. They have to rebuild the walls of the city for defence against their enemies. They've got to build some homes to live in. Uh, and most importantly, they've got to rebuild the temple. Now the temple, under the old covenant at the time they lived, God made himself available to the people at the temple in Jerusalem. It was where they went to have a relationship with God. So the important point to note is that an unfinished temple is not just a practical inconvenience, it's a spiritual crisis. In another book, Ezra chapters 3 and 4, we're told that within two years, um, they'd relayed the foundations for the temple. Good. 
but enemies from outside come along and intimidate them and it derails the progress. Rebuilding then goes on pause for a bit. And by Haggai's day, we're going to fast forward the story and they've been back in the land for 18 years and they're still on pause on rebuilding the temple. So amongst the busyness of rebuilding their lives in Jerusalem, they've been distracted from rebuilding the temple. And so God sends his prophet Haggai with a question to ask them. The question is, what is it time for? That's verses 1 to 4. Have a look at me, please, at Haggai chapter 1, verses 1 to 4. In the second year of King Darius, on the first day of the sixth month, the word of the Lord came through the prophet Haggai to Zerubbabel, son of Shealtiel, governor of Judah, and to Joshua, son of Josedek, the high priest. This is what the Lord Almighty says. These people say, oh, the time's not yet come to rebuild the Lord's house. Then the word of the Lord came through the prophet Haggai. Is it a time for you yourselves to be living in your panelled houses while this house remains a ruin? So imagine the scene with me in Jerusalem. Let's imagine a hypothetical Mr. and Mrs. Israel um, back from exile one rainy Saturday morning in the temple and they're huddling under their umbrella because there's holes in the roof, um, shivering because it's cold. Um, they can see around kind of piles of bricks that are still waiting to be used and have quite a lot of dust on them by now as well. Um, they're freezing cold and they think to themselves, oh, we really must get back to that building of the temple, shouldn't we? It's a really important idea. We must do that soon. And Mr. and Mrs. Israel, they're delighted to go home. Uh, in the home, there's no hole in the roof. Um, it's actually quite nicely tiled. Uh, there's no piles of bricks um, cluttering the place up because they all got used up years ago. It's not freezing cold because not only do they have these stone walls back in place, but they've even got a very nice wooden panelled walls, uh, which insulates the place um, and even look nice, just like all their neighbours do around them. And Mr. Israel, he puts up his feet and he starts thinking to himself, I'd love to have a go at a mezzanine floor. I reckon next bank holiday weekend, that's what I'm going to do. Actually, maybe I could use up a week of annual leave to do it. That's the kind of scene in Jerusalem. The temple remains a ruin, while God's people are busy feathering their nests. And the problem is shown by that contrast. Do you see how that's put in verse 4? This is how God puts it, verse 4. See the contrast. Is the time for you yourselves to be living in your panelled houses while this house remains a ruin? So they live in not just basic houses, but developed panelled houses, while God's house, the temple, is still in ruins. No, it's not a bad thing they live in a house and they rebuilt their houses. It's not actually a bad thing that the houses have some panelling in, in and of itself. You know, houses are a good gift from God. But it's the developed panelled houses which show the contrast, which shows their priorities. It's the contrast of the two that shows their priorities. And the reason they've got into this problem is there in verse 2. Have a look at me, please, at verse 2. This is what the Lord Almighty says. These people say, the time's not yet come to rebuild the Lord's house. Ah, the time's not yet come. It comes down to priorities. Again, they're not saying... Rebuilding the temple is a bad thing to do. I've got these all logical arguments why I'm not doing it. And they're not saying they're never going to do it. But what they are living like is like it's not number one on the to-do list. And how they're using their time and their money on their houses shows their priority in life. Because they say, the time's not quite yet. So the temple lies in ruins because God's people are distracted from the top job the Lord's given them by their domestic pursuits, feathering the nest. And the danger of distraction is still a danger for us, God's people, today. Now, we live in a, a different covenant with God as Christians today than they did back in Haggai's day. In the old covenant back then, the temple was the place um, that God dwelt with his people and mediated his relationship with them. But all that was wonderfully upgraded when Jesus came because he declared he was the temple. He was the fulfillment of everything it pointed towards. We no longer need to go to the temple to have a relationship with God. We need to come to Jesus in faith. And the New Testament tells us that the church is Christ's body. 
the people are being built into a spiritual temple. Uh, Here's 1 Peter in the New Testament. You also, like living stones, are being built into a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, offering spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. So in Christ, Christians are like bricks in this spiritual temple. And the great commission from Jesus that he gave, gave to his disciples after he'd risen from the dead and before he ascended to heaven, he said this, Therefore go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. So the great commission is to go and make disciples of all nations, and that is God's global building project today. And this spiritual house grows as more and more people come to faith in Jesus, brick by brick by brick. And we join in, friends, with this building project as we play our part in the Great Commission. It's the great privilege of spreading far and wide the good news about Jesus. So let me ask us that same question. What is it time for? Or let's put it this way. When's the time to really get going with giving money sacrificially to church so I go without a creature comfort that I'd really like? When's the time to really get going with maybe giving up some time off to meet with another Christian and encourage them? When's the time to really get going with actually taking the risk of asking someone who's not a Christian, um, a friend of yours, to come to church with you? When's the time to really get going with being bold at work with living as a Christian and being known as a Christian, I'm trying to share my faith even? Well, when's the time to really get going with well, actually asking the question, should I even leave my workplace to be in full-time Christian word ministry? When's the time to do that? The danger of distraction is to answer all those by saying, in a bit. After, after I just stopped being so busy for a bit. After my house deposit saved up for, after I finished that really good box set on TV, after I got a bit more career security first, then I'll do it. I'll think about those questions definitely later. Well, as you give careful thought to your ways tonight, let me ask you, as I ask myself, are you distracted? If you were to look through your calendar and say your banking app, what priorities in life do they reflect? Do you feel the pinch of sacrifice in your own life because of gospel decisions that you've made? Well, if the answer to that is yes, can I encourage you tonight? It's not a waste of time. God is delighted with your service. It's actually a healthy sign if your nest is just a bit less feathered than it could be, where you've made sacrificial decisions for the gospel and actually you feel a pinch. You might say, oh, my housing situation is less than ideal. I don't use my time like some of my non-Christian friends, and my social media is just way less impressive. You haven't wasted your time. Because you're building something that will last through to eternity. God's church, not bricks, but people. So consider your ways. Are you distracted? If you think you are, or if you're still not quite sure, well, let me ask you to consider your disappointment. That's our second point here today. Consider your disappointment. Uh, I've really enjoyed watching uh, recently Clarkson's Farm. Uh, It's reality TV. Uh, It's a year in the life of a celebrity presenter turned farmer. And um, it strikes me every time just how hard the farmers work. I mean, um, yeah, Clarkson does work hard. He stays up into the night as he's helping the cows give birth. Uh, He's up early in his tractor his Lamborghini tractor, um, sowing the seeds across the farm. Uh, He's up early doing it, and he pours money into it. He pours ideas and energy into it day after day. But every season so far, it ends the same way. It's the financial reveal, where he gets to find out how much profit has he made from this year in farming. End of series one, do you know how much profit he made? £144. I actually found it quite moving, the, the disappointment on his face. He was just working so hard but harvesting little. 
As we read this next bit of Haggai, think of that kind of disappointment and dissatisfaction that the Israelites are feeling. Um, have a look at me, please, at chapter 1, verse 5. Now this is what the Lord Almighty says. Give careful thought to your ways. You've planted much, but harvested little. You eat, but never have enough. You drink, but never have your fill. You put on clothes, but are not warm. You earn wages, only to put them in a purse with holes in it. And then down to verse 9. You expected much, but see, it turned out to be little. What you brought home, I blew away. Why? declares the Lord Almighty. Because of my house, which remains a ruin, while each of you is busy with your own house. Therefore, because of you, the heavens have withheld their dew and the earth its crops. I called for a drought on the fields and the mountains, on the grain, the new wine, the olive oil, and everything else the ground produces, on people and livestock, and on all the labor of your lands. So God's people are working hard, but harvesting little. God's people are experiencing old covenant curses. Now, what are Old Covenant curses? So remember, again, at this stage in the story, God's people live by his grace in the land of Israel. They're living under God's blessing. God rescued them from slavery in Egypt in the Exodus. He redeemed them and saved them all by his grace. And as his saved people, they're called to be obedient to God in how they live in the land. And so the terms of the Old Covenant had covenant blessings to encourage obedience Um, Here's a quote from Deuteronomy chapter 28, and watch out for the um, similarities to the book of Haggai. God said to them, all these blessings will come on you and accompany you if you obey the Lord your God. You'll be blessed in the city and blessed in the country. The fruit of your womb will be blessed, and the crops of your land and the young of your livestock, the calves of your herds and the lambs of your flocks, your basket and your kneading trough will be blessed. Okay, so offer blessings for obedience. And curses for disobedience. Here's the next bit, chapter 28. However, if you do not obey the Lord your God and do not carefully follow all his commands and decrees I'm giving you today, all these curses will come on you and overtake you. You'll be cursed in the city and cursed in the country. Your basket and kneading trough will be cursed. The fruit of your womb will be cursed and the crops of your land and the calves of your herds and the lambs of your flocks. You'll be cursed when you come in and cursed when you go out. So remember, this wasn't a way that they earned their salvation. They were saved by God's grace like we are. But it was a way that God acted to discipline his spiritual children with the aim of bringing them to repentance. He wanted them to come back to him in obedience. And God's message to the people in Haggai's day is that he himself was holding back their success. Notice in verse 9 how he uses the word I. Verse 9, you expected much, but see it turned out to be little. What you brought home, I blew away. Why, declares the Lord Almighty? Because of my house, which remains a ruin, while each of you is busy with your own houses. So God put a handbrake on on their work because their priorities, they were the wrong way around. And he wants them to change. Now, we need to be really careful as we read this to understand that we, as Christians, live under a different covenant, a new, improved, upgraded one. We're no longer under the same old covenant curses and blessings. The New Testament makes really clear Jesus died on the cross to take the curse we deserved and to make a right relationship with God available to us by faith. But we are lovingly disciplined by our Heavenly Father. Here's Hebrews in the New Testament. But God disciplines us for our good in order that we may share in his holiness No discipline seems pleasant at the time, but painful. Later on, however, it produces a harvest of righteousness. So God still works through our lives to call us to repentance and to train us in godliness. And one of the ways he does that is through the disappointment of success. What I mean by that is when we get the wrong things we were prioritizing, and it doesn't satisfy. The disappointment of success. Um, There's a phrase called buyer's remorse, uh, which is the feeling of regret or disappointment after making a really big purchase. Um, According to a 2022 survey of homeowners, do you know what percentage of homeowners say they feel buyer's remorse? 60%. Don't you hate feeling like that? I've, I've felt it before. You spend your money on something big and important, and you think, when I get that, then I'll be happy. 
And then you get it, and it oh, disappoints. It's the holiday I've been dreaming on for months. And when I'm finally on that beach and I can relax, then life will be good. But then you get there and you just feel angsty and rest is still elusive. It's the job move you were going for for years and you get it and it turns out it hasn't solved all those problems. It's the celebrity who said they chased after fame and success and then they got it all and felt like ashes in their mouth. It's the home improvement you spent so much time thinking about and planning, but now you've got it, it's really grating that you've seen someone else with a better one. That's the disappointment of success. When we get the thing we are prioritizing and then it doesn't satisfy. So let me ask you to, verse 5, give careful thought to your ways. Is what you're working for leaving you feeling disappointed? Might God be using that disappointment to bring your priorities into good order? So consider your disappointment. And third and last, behold God's glory and get to work. Um, Another crazy stat I saw this week is only two out of ten people in the UK say they feel like their life has purpose. Only two in ten. Well, friends, here's an invitation to purpose in your life. Have a look at verse 8. Go up into the mountains and bring down timber and build my house so that I may take pleasure in it and be honoured, says the Lord. So the instruction is go and build. And the reason, God's pleasure and God's honour. God takes pleasure in his temple. God receives honour from his temple. With a ruined temple, God is dishonoured because the nations around laughed at him. They mocked him. And the Israelites back then, that should not be okay with them. It should drive them out of the comfort of their panelled houses to the work of rebuilding. With a built temple, God takes pleasure in it. And the Israelites should rejoice in their God's happiness. That joy should reorder their busyness away from their own houses and onto his God's worthiness of honour is the motivation to reorder our priorities in life. So how worthy, how worthy of honour is Jesus? How would you answer that? We sung earlier, beautiful saviour, you have brought me near. You've pulled me from the ashes. You've broken every curse. Blessed redeemer, you have set this captive free. Lord, I can't help but sing. Do you see Jesus as worthy of your worship? If you're here tonight and and you're not a Christian believer, or you're here tonight and you're you're really thinking things through about Jesus and, and where you stand with him, the question for you tonight is, do you see Jesus as worthy of your worship? He's your creator. He made you. He gave you everything. He's your savior. He died on the cross that trusting in him, you could know forgiveness for everything you've done. And he's good. If you turn in faith to him as worthy of your worship, if you turn to him as the person who's worthy of being the number one priority in your life, if you do, you won't just have Jesus as your saviour or your master or your friend, but you'll have purpose. You'll have a reason to get out of bed in the morning. You'll have a reason to make sacrifices. You'll have the privilege of playing a part in God's global building project for his honour and his pleasure. How worthy of honour is Jesus? He's so good. He's redeemed us. I can't help but sing out that message. So friends, God's worthiness of honour, it's the motivation to reorder our priorities in life and get on with the work of making disciples that God's given us, even when it costs us. And when today, when Christ is dishonoured, if his name is, the name Jesus is used as a swear word or he's considered a myth, Let that sting us into compassionate action. And as we see this global building project going up brick by brick, person by person, let's share in Christ's pleasure and the rejoicing angels in heaven over one sinner who repents. And let's get to the work with a smile on our face. Behold God's glory and get to work. Because for the Israelites, once they did that, everything changed for them. Have a look at verse 14. 
Verse 14, so the Lord stirred up the spirit of Zerubbabel, son of Shealtiel, governor of Judah, and the spirit of Joshua, son of Josedek, the high priest, and the spirit of the whole remnant of the people. They came and began to work on the house of the Lord Almighty, their God. Well, let me know, uh, let me tell you about a couple of people I know who have done just that. Um, Neither of them go to this church. And Sarah was an Australian in her early 20s over in London on a three-year work program. Uh, lots come to London for a few years, um, and with so much to do from Australia, you know, cram all those travelling experiences in, um, all the things you can do, all the shows you can go to in London into their busy weekends, um, you know, often flying to different parts of Europe each weekend. But Sarah was different. Um, sure, she did do some of that, and she really enjoyed it, but actually her Instagram was a lot less exciting than other people's and her peers, and she chose not to do as much as she could. And do you know Why? She told me it was because she committed her Sunday mornings to teaching the Bible to the children in children's groups at church. She wanted to show a new generation how wonderful Jesus is. She wasn't distracted by the limitless opportunities for experiences and fun in London and Europe. She wanted to play her part in building something of eternal value. Um, Stan graduated from a top university with an economics degree and he arrived in London um, expecting to get a good job in the city. But actually what changed things for him in his life was how much he really enjoyed being a part of the team at the Friday Night International Cafe. Uh, It's a bit like this um, church's free English classes here on a Friday night. Uh, What Stan really loved was he loved speaking to people who had come from countries with very, very little access to the gospel. As a part of the team, he'd befriend them. Um, He'd teach people English, and he'd take opportunities to share the gospel with them when they came up. And then he thought to himself, why don't I do exactly that, but do it in a country which knows the name Coca-Cola, but doesn't know the name Jesus? You ever heard that before? Um, Did you know that uh, of the 8 billion-odd global population, 94% recognize the name Coca-Cola? Nearly everyone. But 27.8%, around a third of that 8 billion, have never heard the name of Jesus or have no access to the gospel. So Stan moved out to this country in Central Asia doing what he'd been doing in London at the International Cafe, befriending people, helping teach English and taking opportunities to share the gospel with them. He left his job and his country to go and make disciples. Now, you're not Stan and you're not Sarah. But you are you. What part of God's global building project will you work on? According to a 2022 report on um, Christianity in England, 50% of Christians say they don't know any non-Christians well enough to invite them to church. 50%. And of the non-Christians who have a Christian friend, half of the non-Christians say they've never been told by their friend about Jesus. Some of us might need to hear the word of challenge. Stop being distracted and reorder your priorities. Change your calendar so you do actually spend time with non-Christians and prayerfully try to share Christ with them. And some of us here today will need to hear that word of encouragement. You're giving yourself. You really are because your priority is in God's honour. Well, hear this. The sacrifices are worth it. Because God, he's glorious. So let me ask you to give careful thought to your ways. Behold God's glory. Let's get to work. Let's pray. Our Father, we praise you that you are worthy of honour and glory. You are good and you're our saviour. We praise you for the name of the Lord Jesus and we pray that his name would be heard loud and clear across this city in London. Through us, use us please because we know that you're worthy of our worship. Please forgive us where we've got our priorities wrong. Please help us to reorder our lives and please use us, continue to use us in your global building project, not for our glory but for yours that the Lord Jesus might be shown to be truly, truly wonderful. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.